are confirming that there are three children and one adult that are deceased. Um, we're still in the process of trying to determine everything that happened, but we are asking for assistance of anybody in the community or in the vicinity of this incident who may have surveillance video that would be pointed towards the road so we can try to determine when cars are coming back and forth or uh, if there's anybody else involved in the scene that we don't already have uh, identified. So we are asking any citizens in the area that have any video, go ahead and call the Kent County Sheriff's Office. You're going to call it 616-632-6125. Again, 616-632-6125. Do you still believe that there's not a suspect at large in this situation? We do not believe there's a suspect at large. We don't believe that there's a urgent public safety need, but we are needing some assistance to make sure we're getting to the, the, the facts about what happened today. Sheriff, you said there's three children and one adult. Three involved. children and one adult. Is this a one? Uh, is this a adult a female or a male? Uh, it's a female adult, but I can't give any further identification information whatsoever. And again, we we will have to uh, wait likely until we are able to make the full identification. New information tonight about the mother of the children and what family and investigators suspect was a case of murder suicide. Or records illuminating the efforts to get mental health help for Aubrey Ann Moore as fears mounted that she might be capable of hurting herself or others. Three children shot and killed, lives lost, perhaps at the hand of their own mother, who then may have taken her own life. It is the going theory in what happened here, a possible murder-suicide that on some level was predicted five months ago. Nuevo County court records show that a social worker told a judge that Aubrey Ann Moore was likely to harm herself or others in the near future. The messages in a petition to the court asking a judge to place her in a mental health institution. The judge approved the request. She was sent to Forest View Hospital for treatment near Grand Rapids. Up to 60 days, the order said. Then she was ordered to get outside treatment for up to 90 days after that. How long the hospital stay lasted and what, if any, other treatment was sought is not spelled out in the records. Following her release, there was no apparent effort to involve Child Protective Services, despite the fact that she had custody of children. Three little girls' lives are now gone. They were awesome kids, absolutely great. It is a tragic reality that the father of the oldest two girls told us he struggles to understand. He says Moore loved her children, she was protective of them, and he never could have imagined she would hurt them. Tri-County Area Schools, where two of the girls were students, has activated its crisis response team to help students and staff deal with the loss there. The superintendent sent a letter home to parents saying Cassidy was a first grader at McNaughton Elementary and eight-year-old Kyrie was a third grader at Sand Lake Elementary. Cassidy was remembered by her teacher as a friend to everyone, a hard worker and always on task. Kyrie, who was a third grader at Sand Lake Elementary, was a sweet girl who enjoyed playing and being active. Her teacher, Mrs. Schnepp, shared that Kyrie loved to read, always volunteered to help others. Her classmates loved her and that she was a good friend. There was a lot of concern. These court records detail mental health struggles and an effort from a social worker to try and save this mother. Moore had been diagnosed with schizophrenia. Many have asked how might someone with this kind of diagnosis possibly had access to a gun? That's one of the questions being asked as this investigation continues as we speak tonight. We are reporting live in Solon Township near Cedar Springs. Leon Hendricks. Good morning. My name is Kafu Drasa, and I'm an assistant professor in psychiatry and behavioral sciences, neurobiology, and bioengineering at Duke University. I'm also a resident in my spare time. And, and I thought I'd begin today <laughs> by telling you one of the patients I've taken care of recently. For the sake of maintaining his confidentiality, I'll call him CJ. So CJ was the valedictorian of his high school class and went off to school, full with the hope of one day changing the world. He would get on campus and start having problems concentrating. He soon began getting messages from the TV telling him to hurt himself and to hurt other people. His family would take him to see neurologists, psychiatrists, and he ended up on my inpatient psychiatric unit after trying to kill himself. Once CJ arrived, it was clear that the symptoms 
that CJ was having, the problems with concentration, the, the hearing, the voices, was consistent with the illness that we call schizophrenia. And so we started CJ on an antipsychotic medication. And, and, and over the course of several weeks, CJ went from being critically ill to being what we would call severely ill. See, while this medication had decreased these, these intrusive thoughts, had decreased these urge for CJ to, to hurt himself, it was clear that that valid Victorian child that their parents had sent off to college wasn't back. So I sat down with the parents. I sat down with the parents to explain them the diagnosis. And, and as soon as I said the word schizophrenia, their faces dropped. They looked at me and they said, doctor, 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 could you, maybe something else, maybe early on said Alzheimer's. They said, maybe depression. Could you find, could you find another diagnosis for our child? And the conversation went back and forth for an hour as I was trying to explain to them the diagnosis and the prognosis. And, and finally they looked and they said, you just don't understand. You don't understand the stigma that our child will face if you give him this diagnosis. You don't understand the shame. And so after going back and forth, I, I did something I don't often do. And I, I told them a little bit about my personal story. I'd explained to them that a year prior, I'd been sitting in the seat that they'd been sitting in. So we had a close family friend who'd gone off to a pre-med program. And he began having thoughts that people were trying to harm him and had ended up in my psychiatric ward except I was the one sitting on the opposite side of the table with the doctor giving us the same diagnosis. But see, what I didn't tell them was that my personal story was far more intimate than that. I didn't explain to them my experience of committing a family member when I was in graduate school. I didn't tell them about having an uncle who, who started hallucinating and we found him in a different country in an alleyway. I, I didn't tell them about my time in graduate school when I learned about psychiatric genetics and having this fear every day that I myself would wake up hallucinating the next day. And when I hit 30 and realized that I'd passed that critical window, I didn't tell them how that fear translated into a fear that one day my nieces or my nephews or my children would be diagnosed with one of these illnesses. So it's this fear, it's, it's this experience that leads me to understand this organ that we call the brain. So the brain is an organ made up of over 30, 80 billion cells. And these 80 billion cells are wired together. And everything we are, all of our experiences, is locked up within these cells and how they interact with one another. It, the job of the brain is to take this information from our external world to help us figure out what's best for us, to weigh these decisions, and to prove our survival in a given environment. It's, it's, it's when we wake up in the morning. It's when we lean over and say good morning to our spouse. It's the smell of the fresh coffee. It's us walking down our, the hallway to wake our children up. It's the bonding and the emotional experience we have with them. It's the motor functions, the programs, this opening of the fridge, the driving to work, the remembering what we do at work and going home at the end of the day. Each of these experiences is locked up within this organ that we call the brain. And so if we know that when we talk about neuropsychiatric illness, whether it's schizophrenia, depression, or bipolar disorder, that it occurs because of changes in this organ, the question is, how come we as scientists and physicians haven't figured out how to cure these disorders yet? So I'll give you a little bit of an example. If I was to ask a question to the audience, and I was to say something like, if you would love a cup of fresh coffee right now, please put up your hands. So I'll explain to you what happened in that simple experience. So my mouth creates these pressure waves which travel through the air, the air and strike your eardrum. Your eardrum through its kinesilium changes this pressure energy into chemical energy. The chemical energy is changed to electrical energy, travels down your vestibular and your cochlear nerves, hits the part of your brain stem called the superior olivary nucleus, where it's changed and sent up to your auditory cortex. There it's changed into pitch. The pitch is then combined for most of you in your left side of the brain, where it's changed into words and representations. These representations are processed in the front part of your brain, in the parietal area, the back part of your brain, where it now has these past experiences with coffee. You smell the coffee. You can taste the coffee in your mouth. Your mouth might even start salivating. All of a sudden, your motor cortex begins to interact with your basal ganglia, which Dr. Erz will tell you more about. This information changes the way your upper motor neurons are firing. It sends signals down your spinal cord, synapses on your lower motor neurons, hits your, motor, your muscles in your arm, and then your hand goes up. And that full experience happens in less than half a second. 
So as we begin to think about a choice as simple as, would you like a cup of coffee? The question is, how much more complicated is the experience of seeing things that aren't there, hearing voices that aren't there, and having these experiences wanting to harm ourselves? How much more does our thinking and our processing of what is going on in the brain and what goes wrong in the brain have to come into play? So I am an engineer by background, and, and, and what we do is think about these questions of neuropsychiatric illness from the standpoint of an engineer, from the standpoint of neural networks and neural net circuits. And so, of course, you see a mouse on the, on the board, and some of you may be, are probably asking the right questions. What in the world can a mouse tell us about the disorders that we're seeing? I mean, a mouse can experience the majority of symptoms that, that bring about the, the distress in the patients as we see. So the mice don't do guilt. The mice don't do shame. The mice don't do suicidality. You can't ask a mouse if it's seeing things that aren't there. If you do ask a mouse, the mouse isn't going to answer. <laughs> and if the mouse does answer, it's probably time for a vacation. <laughs> so we have this full array of genes now that we know are contributing in some way, shape, or form to neuropsychiatric illness. We know we have these pharmacological agents that can recapitulate or recreate symptoms that you see in the human disorders. And so for us, the real question is, how do these genetic influences, how do these pharmacological influences change the way the brain works and how the neurocircuitry works? If you were to think about an example like Parkinson's disease, one of the things you see in the disorder is that the handwriting gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And, and of course, mics don't pick up pencils and they don't write sentences. But can you still understand how changes in the brain would change how the motor function in one's hand works? That's what models give us. They give us an ability to ask a question on the background of a substrate, in this case, a mouse. So we ask the question, you know, handwriting may not come out of the connection between a brain and a hand and a mouse in the same way that a part of a connection in the brain may not produce suicidal behavior in a mouse, but can we still understand that connection, that information, and that circuitry? So we study how the brain works together as an entire engineered network. And this happens by recording and reading this information in real time at the speed of processing. So one signal every millisecond that we're getting across entire neural networks, and we study this across 12 to 13 brain areas simultaneously. Now, if, if you think about this problem, this becomes a real problem of communication. So schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, is no longer a problem with one brain area. It's how these brain areas communicate to each other. I'll give you an example. In my home, the problems never arise because my wife isn't talking, and she's here this morning. The problems arise because I'm not listening. <laughs> so there are these clear problems in communication. And this information processing is a function of communication and information moving back and forth. I'm old enough to remember a time when you, know, when you had to make a phone call. There was a landline, there was MCI and Sprint back then. You pick up and make a phone call. If there was a storm outside, sometimes you'd lose this landline. And the communication was lost. But now we have this amazing thing called cell phones. And so the question is, can we create essentially a cell phone to take communication signals around these functional disconnections in the brain? So we study this using mice. And you see an example here of brain, air, brain signals that we're pulling out of the animal's brain in real time over the course of five to 10 minutes here across an entire neural network. And what we're able to then do is ask questions, do changes in gene function does stress, the drugs of abuse, the things that recapitulate or make the schizophrenia symptoms much more severe, do they change communication in the brain? And so what you're seeing here is just a picture. It's a little map that we use. It has frequency, which is a function of signal in the brain waves. The blue is an indicator of low communication. The red is an indicator of high communication. And then we ask how our manipulations, genes, stress, drugs of abuse, change communications in parts of the brain. And then our goal becomes, once we can find where the communication goes bad, how do 100 different schizophrenia-related genes hit the same part of a brain network? Then we can create the tools, the, the cell phone, to reconnect that part of the brain network. And so the goal of what we're working on creating in the brain is neuroprosthetics, brain pacemakers, tools that reconnect brain circuits, things that will get us past thinking about drugs. I know you asked about that before. These are, these are techniques based on electricity, the, the techniques based on putting energy back in the brain. And you'll hear a little bit about that uh, later in the, in the day today. And so this, this concept may seem far-fetched. You can imagine 120 years ago showing up in the hospital and you're saying, I have chest pain. Well, I'm, I'm having this chest pain. It's radiating to my right ear. And somebody says, I've got this great idea. Why don't we like, look into the heart pull electrical activity out of the heart, and I can tell you what's going on with your heart. And then, you know, I, I've got this great idea. Then we could put electricity back into the heart, 
to reconnect wherever the disconnection may be. You'd say, wow, that's so incredibly far-fetched, probably as far-fetched as you think this may be this morning hearing about me talk about the brain this way. But of course, we have tools now that are so commonplace. When you go into the emergency room, someone puts on an EKG and they ask about electrical patterns of connectivity within your heart. And they can say, yes, you have a right bundle branch block. Yes, you have an AV node block. Yes, you have tertiary heart block. And because of this loss of connection, the functional processing, what the heart does, is loss. And so the, the idea would be to do the same thing in the brain, right? Could we use tools that are available, whether that's pulling EEG signals or magnetoencephalography, this is using magnetic fields to read electrical activity of the brain in real time, to find these functional lesions and functional changes once we have essentially this codex, this Rosetta Stone that we develop in mice on how the genes change specific brain networks. So it tells us where to look. It's the map. And then can we put energy back into the brain in a way that the circuits are reconnected? That energy can be put back in tools using transcranial magnetic stimulation. So there are ways of getting magnetic fields to stimulate electrical activity in the brain and reconnect these networks. Or direct current stimulation or tools like optogenetics where we can use light stimulation to directly repair given parts of brain circuits. And so for us, this is the future. This is what we're going after in the lab. And, and Dr. Crone has been an amazing mentor on the course of the last 10 years. I, I walked in his office and said, you know, I've got this idea of creating pacemakers for the brain. And he's been nurturing me and walking me through that experience for the last 10 years. And it's certainly an honor to be here as part of the, the, the Sydney Bear legacy. It's an honor to be here as part of BVRS reg legacy and Mark Crone's as well. And so if there are any questions at all, I'm more than happy to field them. I know this is a little bit uh, different than talking about the normal neurotransmitters and the receptors and the proteins as well. Thank you so much.